It's 8 o'clock. Good morning. This is Northern Light for Thursday, October 26th. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. NCPR is launching a new series on far-right extremism in the North Country. And we start in Lewis County, where the sheriff has ties to anti-government groups who say sheriffs don't have to follow laws they think are unconstitutional. If all else fails, if all else fails, then we know what we have to do. Then we know. I don't believe yet that we're there yet. Experts say this ideology is authoritarian and dangerous. A special report coming up. Also, North Country Congresswoman Elise Stefanik nominated a new House Speaker Mike Johnson yesterday. The Louisiana Republican received unanimous support from his conference, ending the House's weeks-long stint without a leader. A deeply respected constitutional lawyer, Mike has dedicated his life to preserving America's great principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And we wrap up the show with music and a look at the community calendar to help you make plans for the weekend. All of that and more is coming up on Northern Light. Stick with us. Broadcast of Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio is supported by Gray and Gray and Associates, CPAs, an accounting and financial services firm in northern New York with offices in Canton, Potsdam, and Spring Hill, Florida. GrayCPAS.com and AdirondackExplorer.com and AdirondackAlmanac.com presenting daily updated news on public policy, environmental issues, and local communities in the Adirondack Park. This is Northern Light. I'm Monica Sandreski. And I'm Todd Moe. The FBI and Homeland Security officials are worried about far-right extremism nationwide, including here in the North Country. They see militias and anti-government, anti-government uh, uh, activists as potential domestic terrorism threats. And they're especially worried about that threat coming from within law enforcement. Jackie Bray is Commissioner of New York State's Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services. We know that domestic extremists and organizations, the Oath Keepers, the Proud Boys, the Three Percenters, the Bugalo Boys, recruit in formal military and in active law enforcement. And it is incredibly concerning to me. And I think New Yorkers should be aware that that is a tactic of these groups. Today, we're launching a series on far-right extremism in the North Country. We start with a profile of Lewis County Sheriff Mike Carpinelli. He has ties to at least two groups described by experts as anti-government and extremist. Reporters Emily Russell and Zach Hirsch bring us his story. It's a cold February night back in 2020. Folks are packed inside the Lewis County Courthouse in Lowville. We want to thank you for coming today. People are overflowing into the hall, which is not typical for a county board meeting. But this is a meeting about gun control. This meeting is part of a push to designate Lewis County as a Second Amendment sanctuary, meaning there wouldn't be local enforcement of state gun laws. 30 minutes in, a man who's been standing at the back walks to the front of the crowd. I get a chance to speak yet, and I'd like to build a chance to talk as a sheriff of this county for the people that are here, okay? Yeah. Lewis County Sheriff Mike Carpinelli. He's in uniform and has a grave expression on his face. Carpinelli is all for the Second Amendment sanctuary idea. He turns to the crowd. This is no joke, Carpinelli says. This is the fight for your lives as you know it in a free republic. Freedom. 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 Almost on. The crowd is fired up behind him. You can hear it. Carpinelli calls Governor Andrew Cuomo a tyrant, says politicians in Albany are against people in Lewis County. But then there's something else Carpinelli says that goes beyond guns. He reminds the room where his allegiance lies. So tonight, I support everybody in this room. But I absolutely support the Constitution, the oath that I took. I will support that way before I'll support the state, way before I'll support the county constitution or any other constitution. (laughs) 
A few weeks later, Carpinelli emailed some colleagues about Second Amendment sanctuaries. He wrote, quote, We will prevail, but not without a fight. It will be done with faith, education, elections, and force when necessary. Force when necessary. That kind of language worries state and federal counterterrorism officials. In the end, Lewis County did not become a Second Amendment sanctuary. But for the local gun rights crowd, Carpinelli was a hero. Still is. It's been moments like this that have made Carpinelli popular in Lewis County. While other conservative sheriffs in the North Country say they're obligated to follow state laws, Carpinelli basically says not necessarily. Carpinelli is part of an ideological movement among law enforcement officials around the country called the Constitutional Sheriffs, led by former Arizona Sheriff Richard Mack. Here he is speaking with Carpinelli in a video interview last year. Are you more powerful than any state or federal agent or even the president in your county? In my county, mm-hmm. yes. Max Group teaches sheriffs they don't have to follow laws they think are unconstitutional. And we should say very clearly here, experts tell us that ideology is authoritarian and dangerous. And the constitutional sheriffs is considered a far-right anti-government movement. The sheriffs in that movement see themselves as the true patriots, the last line of defense against tyranny. We reached out to Carpinelli multiple times over the months. He turned down our interview request. We wanted to ask him about his legal philosophy and statements like this one from that same interview with Richard Mack. I believe in defending our country. If all else fails, if all else fails, then we know what we have to do. Then we know. I don't believe yet that we're there yet. We're going to dive into these kinds of statements, this belief system. We'll look into Carpinelli's connections to the constitutional sheriffs and another group, the Oath Keepers. That's the militia at the center of the January 6th attack on the U.S. Capitol. The Oath Keepers were part of organizing an attack on our democracy. Law enforcement leaders should not have formal relationships with them, full stop. What makes a county sheriff think that he has more power than other branches of the government? We know that authoritarianism is on the rise around the world. And in some U.S. counties, this movement to empower constitutional sheriffs has taken hold. And people are buying in. They can't force him to do certain things, which we're glad of anyways. And he knows that the people here are going to back him on that. Lewis County is really conservative. Carpinelli has been re-elected sheriff three times and even ran for governor. And he's popular, not in spite of saying he won't enforce certain laws and mandates, but in part because of it. Being a gun owner, I would side with him on some of the stuff that royally ticks you off if you're a freedom-loving person who owns firearms. But first, a bit of backstory. Mike Carpinelli grew up in the Hudson Valley. He enlisted in the U.S. Army Reserve after high school. Carpinelli became a police officer in the mid-80s. He worked in Kingston, in Rochester, and eventually moved to Lewis County. He started as a deputy, then was elected sheriff in 2011. Again, we reached out to Carpinelli several times for this story. He declined our interview request. So we dug into a lot of his past interviews and public appearances. And it turns out Carpinelli's been really out front with his far-right views. We wanted to figure out how he went down this path how he aligned himself with the far-right anti-government movement. And why his politics resonate with so many people. One thing was immediately clear. Gun rights play a central role in that story. New York Governor Andrew Cuomo signed a law that is the toughest gun law in the nation right now and tried to... In the wake of the Sandy Hook mass shooting, when 20 children and six adults were massacred at an elementary school in Connecticut, New York passed the SAFE Act. It was a new gun law banning high-capacity magazines and creating a registry for assault weapons, among other tight restrictions. Like many conservatives in the North Country, Carpinelli came out against the legislation. He rallied in Albany, and according to a Rochester newspaper, he said he would not enforce it. Signs calling for the SAFE Act to be repealed popped up all over the North Country, and Carpinelli's hardline stance really resonated with people here, still does today. People like Gene Stanford, who lives in the Lewis County village of Port Leiden. He's a good man for the Second Amendment. And uh, in this area, that's a big thing. That's a big plus. To my knowledge, yes, he, there's some laws he don't have to deal with. Because he works for us, this is why he's doing what he's doing. 
The year the SAFE Act was passed, Carpinelli connected with Richard Mack, the founder of the Constitutional Sheriffs and Peace Officers Association. Here's Mack speaking at a far-right conference in 2021. We can take back America county by county and state by state. And if the state doesn't want to do it, then we'll do it county by county, one good sheriff at a time. Constitutional sheriffs believe local authorities, not the federal government, have the final say in deciding what is and isn't constitutional. We should point out legal scholars have told us they don't have the final say. And Rachel Goldwasser with the Southern Poverty Law Center says they're doing more than just pushing a fringe legal theory. Their goal is really to just radicalize every single sheriff in the country into determining that they're not going to follow particular federal and even state laws. Carpinelli was one of the keynote speakers at a Constitutional Sheriff's National Conference a few years ago. And today, his photo is on the group's homepage, endorsing Mac, who in turn calls Carpinelli a good friend. This tape is from Mac's talk show. Uh, he's on our website, very loyal to me. And when anybody talks about constitutional sheriffs in New York, Mike Carpinelli is the first name that comes up. As Carpinelli got more into politics, pushing back against gun laws, he was also connecting with that other group we've mentioned, the Oath Keepers. In 2013, the Oath Keepers put out a call to form county sheriff posses. A lot of people reportedly left the group in the years that followed as the Oath Keepers became a militia and got more violent in their rhetoric. Despite that violent rhetoric, Carpinelli stuck by them. In 2016, he accepted the New York Oath Keepers Constitutional Sheriff Award. Today, a photo of him holding that award is the top image on his professional Facebook page. Rich Giardino is a Republican sheriff in nearby Fulton County. He's also very conservative. But when he was invited to join the Oath Keepers, he said no. Giardino knows Carpinelli personally, says he trusts him as a sheriff, but has hesitations about the groups he's connected to. It sounds good, Oath Keeper. You took an oath to the Constitution. Sounds great, you know, but then stick with your oath to the Constitution. I think that some of the leadership in some of these places are too extreme, that I don't want my name to be attached to that message. The Oath Keepers played a key role in the January 6 attack on the U.S. Capitol, where a mob threatened to hang members of Congress and Vice President Mike Pence. Multiple people died during and after the attack. For months, President Donald Trump and his allies had been falsely claiming that the election was stolen. On that day, Carpinelli was at a Stop the Steal rally in Albany. In a Facebook Live video, Carpinelli's speech sounded almost biblical. Don't be discouraged by what you hear from the tongues that are not of the pure. Months after January 6th, Oath Keepers founder Stuart Rhodes emailed his supporters, encouraging them to rally for people arrested in connection with the Capitol riot. We got that email chain through a Freedom of Information request. And Carpinelli is on that email chain. Carpinelli responded to Rhodes, writing, Hi, Stuart. Good to hear you, sir. And told Rhodes he'd attended one of those rallies within the past week. The sheriff has said he does not condone the violence that happened on January 6th. But he's also downplayed that day and the real threat it posed to democracy. Carpinelli also vouched for one of the people arrested for entering the Capitol, calling him a good friend. Someone from Lewis County wrote an op-ed about that statement, saying Carpinelli should, quote, hang his head in shame. But when we brought up January 6th in recent interviews in Lewis County, most people sounded more like this. I think the whole thing was pretty blown out of proportion. That's Cindy Nortz, who lives in Lowville. We also asked about Carpinelli's ties to the Oath Keepers and the Constitutional Sheriffs. What do you think about your sheriff being involved in some of those kinds of groups? Do you have any problems with it? No, I don't really. It's not illegal to associate with the Oath Keepers or the Constitutional Sheriffs or to rally. But Jackie Bray, Commissioner of New York's Division of Homeland Security and Emergency Services, says Carpinelli's behavior is concerning. The Oath Keepers leaders have been convicted of seditious conspiracy and of organizing a coup against the democratic leadership of this country. There's nothing more offending to me than that. She's talking about the idea of democracy with a little d. In a democracy, voters elect politicians to make laws and law enforcement, well, enforces those laws. But constitutional sheriffs say they can choose which laws they believe in. And we've seen that with Mike Carpinelli in Lewis County. 
first over guns and more recently other big issues that affect a lot of people like the pandemic. Carpinelli pushed back on state COVID mandates, refusing to enforce what he called an unlawful quarantine. Here he is at a county board meeting in 2021. For all of us to be such sheep and be in such fear is absolutely ridiculous. Now you're going to use a law enforcement official to try to get people to stay in their house. Not a chance from this guy. Then a few months ago, Carpinelli waded into the debate over gender identity in schools. In a Facebook Live interview, he referred to gender policies as, quote, mind control. If any parent goes to school, they find out that, that the administration is pushing this pedophile, this, this anti-gender crap, and a parent feels that their child has been endangered by the school system, we'll send down a deputy or an investigator and we will arrest that school teacher. The sheriff is suggesting he could arrest someone for teaching something he doesn't agree with, not something that's against the law. To me, as a scholar who studies these things, it smacks of authoritarianism, right? That's Joe Henderson. He's a professor at Paul Smith's College in the Adirondacks. It's this kind of belief that, like, you should be deferential to certain kinds of authority and, like, anybody who deviates from that authority, like, needs to be punished. Henderson and others who study extremism say this is why this kind of rhetoric matters. He says it's a local authority picking and choosing which laws to enforce, leaving an entire population potentially at the mercy of one person's ideology. How does somebody, on the one hand, believe that the government shouldn't tread on them while also being literally an agent of the state? And the way that's a smooth ideology, right, is that you believe that your interpretation of the state is the correct one. Carpinelli is one of eight constitutional sheriffs around New York and dozens across the country. As for the Oath Keepers, a leaked list showed at one point there were nearly 2,000 members in New York, including dozens in law enforcement. Drive around Lewis County and you'll see a lot of signs in support of Mike Carpinelli. Some people still even have Carpinelli for governor signs from a couple of years ago. We're now entering the town of Laville. We drove around and talked to a lot of people, both in person and later over the phone. We wanted to figure out how Carpinelli's behavior, his embrace of a fringe ideology, is even possible. Here's what we know. First, plenty of people just aren't aware of any of that stuff. We asked Lydia Eastman from Glenfield about Carpinelli's connections to the Oath Keepers and constitutional sheriffs. I don't keep up with that. I don't even know what that means. But here's what Eastman does know about Carpinelli. I've seen a lot of his signs around. I've never had any encounters with him, but I know that he's helped a lot of my friends and family in the community. Second, there are people in Lewis County who are aware of those ties and his statements and who either love Carpinelli for it, like Gene Stanford, who we heard from earlier... Or it's just not the most important thing about the sheriff. Like for Richard Defone, who's actually a former village judge from Lowville. He says you can't pick and choose which laws to follow, but overall... Well, I think he's done a good job as a sheriff. I think he uh, brought innovation instead of the department, and the department's run pretty well. Some people in Lewis County are concerned about Carpinelli, but most didn't want to talk on tape, said they were scared of the repercussions. One county lawmaker, a Republican, also didn't want to talk on tape, but did give us some insight into the sheriff and his career, describing Carpinelli as the most popular politician in Lewis County. The people of Lewis County consistently elect him, the lawmaker said, adding, quote, there's no secret about where he stands. For North Country Public Radio, I'm Emily Russell. And I'm Zach Hirsch. This story is part of a new series on far-right extremism in the North Country that we're calling If All Else Fails. The series has support from Grist and the Center for Rural Strategies and the music in this story from the Blue Dot Sessions. Emily and Zach will have more reporting in the coming weeks. Listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. It is 820. 
Good morning. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. Coming up, music from the intercultural ensemble Interwoven. That's coming up in just a few minutes right here on Northern Light. This is music by Paul Myers, a guitarist in Colton. Check out more of Paul's music anytime on our website, ncpr.org slash underscore. Northern Light is supported by Cronin's Golf Resort, offering golfers the opportunity to experience the fall foliage. Details at croninsgolfresort.com. North Country Congresswoman Elise Stefanik nominated new House Speaker Mike Johnson yesterday. During remarks on the floor, she praised the Louisiana Republican for his work on the House Judiciary and Armed Services Committee and as vice chair of the Republican Conference. A man of deep faith, Mike epitomizes what it means to be a servant leader. A deeply respected constitutional lawyer, Mike has dedicated his life to preserving America's great principles of life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Johnson is the third person Stefanik has nominated for speaker this year. She put up former speaker Kevin McCarthy of California for the first of 15 ballots in January and nominated Jim Jordan of Ohio last week. Johnson was elected with unanimous Republican support after the House went three weeks without a speaker following McCarthy's ouster earlier this month. He's a four-term congressman and an ally of former President Donald Trump. Like Stefanik, he served on Trump's defense team in the first impeachment trial. He also voted against certifying the 2020 election. The trial of a Hebron man who's accused of shooting and killing a Schuylerville woman in April has been postponed. 65-year-old Kevin Monahan allegedly shot 20-year-old Kaylin Gillis as the car she was in was leaving his driveway on April 15th. Gillis and three of her friends got lost looking for a friend's house in Washington County. They drove up the wrong driveway, stayed in their car, and turned around. Authorities say that's when Monaghan came out of his house and fired a shotgun twice, striking the vehicle once. Gillis died of her injuries. Monaghan was charged with second-degree murder. According to News Channel 13, his trial was scheduled to begin earlier this week, but delays with the analysis of some evidence in the case forced Warren County Judge Adam Michelini to adjourn. Michelini has summoned the the attorneys in the case to a conference next week. News Channel 13 reports that's when they'll work out a plan for a new trial date. One of the North Country's health systems has returned to a mask optional policy for most of its locations. Samaritan Health still requires face masks in its emergency department and long-term care facilities. The organization says that's because of an increase in COVID cases among long-term care residents and higher risk for exposure in the ER. Samaritan's other locations may require face masks if they experience a COVID outbreak. Visitors will be notified about that when they arrive, and those who refuse to mask will be asked to leave. New Yorkers have until the end of this week to register to vote in next month's election. Saturday, October 28th, is the last day to get your application to your local board of elections by mail or in person. Early voting starts that same day and runs through Sunday, November 5th. There's also still time if you want to vote by absentee ballot. The deadline to apply in person at your local board of elections is Monday, November 6th. You're listening to Northern Light here on North Country Public Radio. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski. In just a minute, music from the intercultural group Interwoven. They'll give a concert next month in the Adirondacks. Then stick around after the show for Bird Note. We'll explore the connections between bird-inspired yoga poses and Hindu mythology and philosophy. That's just ahead at 842. But first, Todd has a look at the weather for us. 
Mild weather today, tomorrow, and into Saturday, but then it's going to turn colder. Highs in the 60s, near 70 today and tomorrow with occasional light rain. Lows in the 50s. Saturday, a high in the 60s with a good chance of rain. Then it's going to feel more like autumn with highs starting on Sunday in the 40s. A chance of showers on Monday. Cloudy and 61 right now in Canton. The New York-based intercultural ensemble Interwoven will give a concert on Sunday, November 12th at 3 o'clock at the Saranac Methodist Church on Route 3 in Saranac. It's presented by Hill and Hollow Music. Interwoven celebrates and integrates traditional Asian music and Western classical music. They've been praised for their bold originality and versatility. Here's Interwoven performing music that honors Asian and European perspectives. The New York-based intercultural ensemble Interwoven will give a concert on Sunday, November 12th at 3 o'clock at the Saranac Methodist Church on Route 3 in Saranac. Visit hillandhollowmusic.org for more information and for tickets. Several galleries and hallways at VIEW, the art center in Old Forge, are filled with quilts this season. This year's Quilt Unlimited show features the work of regional, national, and international quilters working across genres from bed and wall quilts to art and abstract quilts. The exhibit, which continues through December 2nd, includes more than 70 quilts. Claire Oler, a longtime Old Forge quilter, is chair of the show, and she told me that she'd like viewers to remember that fabric and fiber are art. And it's been a while, a long while, for people to come to that realization. I mean, you look at a watercolor or pastel or oil and you say, well, yeah, that's art. But fabric is art also, can be art, right? And here in this facility, which is a beautiful place, I think people can get that, can grasp that image better. And it doesn't have to be considered an art quilt. It could be a more traditional quilt. But that is art. It's the way colors are put together, the fabrics, the textures, et cetera. And I think we are seeing more and more appreciation of that. We'll hear more about the Quilts Unlimited show at View in Old Forge coming up tomorrow morning during Northern Light. And that exhibit continues through December 2nd. That's it for the show for the day. Morning Edition continues in just a minute. Then stick around after that for the Marketplace Morning Report coming up between 8.51 and 9 o'clock where we'll get caught up on all the morning's business news. Then at lunchtime today, join us for Fresh Air. The New Yorker's Jonathan Blitzer will talk on the chaos surrounding the next Speaker of the House. We'll also talk about Jim Jordan who lost his bid for Speaker but remains the head of the powerful Judiciary Committee. That conversation at lunchtime today between noon and one o'clock right here on North Country Public Radio. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great day. Be well. I'm Todd Moe. And I'm Monica Sandreski.